Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Assemblywoman Black. Assemblywoman Gorlo. Assemblyman Hafen. Assemblywoman Krasner. Assemblyman Matthews. Assemblyman Orentlicker. Assemblywoman Peters. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Assemblywoman Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Titus. Chair Wynn. Here. Um, and I know we have other members that are coming in. Um, I want to get started though. We do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. So we do have a quorum. Um, and Madam Secretary, as people arrive, if you can mark them present, I see Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson has just joined us as well. So if we can mark her present as well. Um, welcome to our audience joining us on this meeting, either um, online, by person, or in person. And today we have four bill hearings. Um, just for some housekeeping before we begin, members of the public may provide testimony in a various way, all of which are listed on the agenda on Nellis. You may submit public comment either in writing in addition to testifying or in lieu of testifying. Written public comment may also be submitted before, during, and up to 48 hours after the meeting's adjournment. Finally, please put your electronic devices, especially cell phones and laptops, on silent during the meeting. With that, we will move on to our first agenda item. At this time, um, I will also note that it appears that Assemblywoman Gorlo is now present as well, so if we can mark her present as well. I will open the bill hearing on Senate Bill 70. Um, and welcome to our presenters. I believe we have Ms. Flood on the... Um, Zoom here, and I believe she is going to be presenting along with Dr. Titus, who uh, I believe is on her way as well. Um, so I will turn this over to you. I remind our presenters and speakers to please clearly state your name and spell your name um, prior, or not spell your name each time, but <laughs> say your name prior to speaking, just so our secretary can keep track of who is speaking. And Ms. Flood, with that, I will turn that over to you. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Wynn, or Chair Wynn. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jessica Flood and I'm Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator for the Northern Region. To start this presentation, I wanted to note that I included a few slides. I guess I should share my PowerPoint. Um, I included a few slides at the front uh, that talk about the background of the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board. We started this work in uh, 2017 to prepare for the 2019 session. We successfully passed AB 85 in modernizing and clarifying the mental health crisis hold process. Uh, and in that process, we really had a deeper understanding of NRS 433A and SB 70 is really a continuation of that work. So I know our time is short and I'll skip those slides for presentation, but I wanted to include them for your reference. Okay, just one moment. I'm gonna put this on full screen. Okay. Um, so these are the first slides that I was just mentioning. Uh, part of the product of AB 85 was we developed this brochure that we sent out to all the hospitals, 10,000 copies in the last year. Um, and so I would hope that that type of work would continue with SB 70 if it were to pass. So I wanted to start out with a brief inter or overview of mental health crisis holds. All 50 states in the U.S. have involuntary mental health hold laws to protect people and communities from risk of harm to self or others, or inability to care for self due to mental illness. Um, it's the greatest loss of individual rights in society other than arrest, and is based upon the constitutional ability of police intervention for harm to self or others. Nevada's mental health crisis hold lasts for 72 hours, which is very uh, common among the states. And it includes the process of detention and application uh, for emergency admission, medical evaluation, and then certification that the individual is indeed in a mental health crisis. At any time after medical evaluation and certification, uh, that individual may be admitted into an inpatient psychiatric facility under emergency admission. If the crisis lasts longer than 72 hours, uh, the a petitioner needs to petition the court for an involuntary court-ordered admission into an inpatient psychiatric facility 
uh, for treatment for up to six months. And then I just want to also note that since 2014, Nevada has also had an involuntary outpatient treatment uh, mechanism in the law as well that's known as assisted outpatient treatment and also lasts up to six months. So this is a quick overview of what I just discussed, showing the steps of the mental health crisis hold, and that's just for your reference. And these are the changes that we made in SB 70. We really tackled many pieces of the mental health crisis hold process. Uh, so you'll see that we updated the terms, definitions, and criteria for the mental health crisis hold process. Uh, we updated chemical restraint definition, uh, the family petition process. Um, we clarified and defined emergency admission updated the involuntary court ordered admission into inpatient psychiatric hospitals, uh, updated conditional release, and then also updated uh, assisted outpatient treatment and created a more clear process. So I just wanna note right here that many of these concepts are not likable per se, but they are necessary. And we, you know, sometimes we have legislators that have wanted to vote against these but really by voting against this, you're voting against clarifying the law. The effort of SB 70 is not to create any new mechanisms, just to clarify and update those mechanisms so we have a more transparent process that patients and families and providers can understand. We're trying to get everyone on the same page. So we really see this as upholding patient rights. So in the process of developing SB 70, we have very diverse stakeholder involvement. Uh, I've facilitated a statewide mental health crisis whole work group at the request of the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board since 2017. Uh, and we've had very strong participation from Clark County Judge Yeager, Washoe County's Judge Liu, uh, the Public Defenders, Division of Public and Behavioral Health, Nevada Hospital Association, et cetera. Uh, you can read the list yourselves here. And then from the youth side, we had a lot of participation from the Nevada Department of Education, this school district in Clark County, uh, DCFS, both in the rurals and in the urban areas, and then family advocates, a lot of participation from Nevada PEP. So the bill is huge, uh, 70 pages, it's complex, but really it can be broken down into five elements. So it updates and modernizes the mental health crisis hold law. It updates assisted outpatient treatment, conditional release. We did not create the youth mental health crisis hold process that was created in the 2019 legislative session. We just adjusted some pieces so that it actually is workable and is in, aligned with uh, parental rights. And then we updated the chemical restraint definition as well. So uh, I'll just walk you through each one of these uh, processes. The first one, updating the mental health crisis whole process and defining terms. So like I said, AB 85, we made a few changes that were kind of low hanging fruit. But as we got into NRS 433, we realized that it was written in 1975. And because there haven't been any changes since then, it reads like it's from 1975. So it really reads right now, like a law enforcement officer detains an individual and applies for emergency admission into an inpatient psych facility. So it's a one-step process where they detain and take them into an inpatient psych facility for evaluation. That's not our current system. Our current system is now detainment and you're brought to either a mental health crisis center or a hospital ER where you're evaluated and observed there. And a large percentage of people are taken off of that hold because they're found stable or to not meet the criteria. So that step was missing in our statute. And we really tried to break apart that first mental health crisis hold and then the emergency admission to try to modernize the law. So our proposed solutions were sections 28 to 32, updating the mental health crisis hold process to align with current practice clearly separating, like I said, the mental health crisis hold from emergency admission. Uh, in sections three through eight, we uh, actually developed definitions for the terms that were used in the law so that everyone can be in the same page. 
Uh, Section 26, we had, because we ad adjusted an application for emergency admission, we're now using a more neutral term, which is mental health crisis hold. Uh, before the attorney general would approve forms for the admission of people to inpatient psych, and now we have it that they, they will approve the forms for detainment evaluation treatment and conditional release, just to expand that uh, the added terms that we developed. We clarified the family petition for court ordered pickup. The problem was uh, that the process that was in law was pretty unworkable and vague. So we updated it. Section nine develops the petition process for court ordered pickup and evaluation of individuals suspected to meet criteria for mental health crisis. In section 36, so it removes the ability for the spouse, parent, adult, children, or legal guardian to petition for straight uh, admission to an inpatient psych facility. Uh, because we're always trying to think so it's nice to have kind of screens and filters for people to go into inpatient psych facilities. Um, and so with the current process now, it makes sense for them to go to a hospital ER. And then um, if they are deemed appropriate and based on their insurance, they can go into an inpatient psych facility. So this one step process straight into the inpatient psych facility is reminiscent of the 1970s and no longer is necessary. Uh, we clarified the hospital and court procedure for individuals who cannot be medically cleared in 72 hours. Again, that process was really unworkable in the law, and we made it so that it's clear. Hospitals didn't have a place in the law to turn to to understand, you know, what what process to take when those individuals are not medically cleared within that time. Um, and so we corrected that. We also updated hospital times for notifying uh, guardians and courts. Currently in law, hospitals are required to provide a notice of discharge to courts and guardians for patients who are under involuntary court ordered admission 10 days prior to discharge. That's actually a longer length of stay than the average length of stay that people stay in inpatient psychiatric units, which is now about seven days. Uh, so we brought those times down to three days prior to discharge and we also allowed for flexibility for hospitals because there's people who only stay for one day sometimes um, so we just tried to create more reasonable guidelines for that notification because it's an essential part of that discharge process so sections 39 47 48 and 48.5 uh, made those uh, changes we clarified the involuntary court ordered and county tra transfer process. This sounds boring, but it is really important. Uh, patients were getting lost in the system as they were transferred between counties, and there was no standard timeline that existed to ensure detention doesn't extend beyond legal limits. Um, and so section 39 requires a person who submits such a petition to notify court if the subject of the petition is admitted in the facility, and is then transferred to another facility. So that helps courts who have ordered people in to keep track of where these people go. Section 41.5 clarifies the court transfer process when examining personnel are not available and the county of residence is responsible. So again, there's times where like Esmeralda County does not have the resources to be able to do this court ordered admission. By law, they're able to transfer that to another county and it was vague in the law. So we've been able to clear to clarify it so that courts can be on the same page with that. And then direct file in the county of treatment. So it allows this mechanism for the petitioner, let's say a rural hospital, uh, knows that the person is going to West Hills in, in Washoe. Um, they can petition Washoe to do the court ordered admission and that way Washoe can have oversight of that patient while they're in the Washoe system. Um, and so that creates a more streamlined process and also conforms to current practice. Uh, conti in continuing this update of the involuntary court ordered and county transfer process, uh, one of the problems was that courts throughout the state order patients into state services without the necessary evaluation and acceptance process. This happens a lot with NAMs and SNAMs. Um, and so we there needs to be an actual acceptance process from the hospital um, and following admission guidelines. So we clarified that once a person is involuntarily 
involuntarily admitted to a mental health facility, the admitted court can transfer the case and the mental health facility is required to notify the court if the person is transferred. And that's actually already in law, right? Like once you do one court ordered admission, that's it. You have that court ordered admission. And right now what's happening is some of the rural courts will do the court ordered admission and then try to transfer the case to the urban areas. So you can see it's messy because there's just um, not much clarity in the law. Section 50 of this bill prohibits the transfer of a consumer who has been admitted to a mental health facility or required to receive assisted outpatient treatment um, to another facility or provider of treatment unless arrangements have made regarding the cost of treatment. So again, like we just need to be, be on the same page when there's transfers uh, and work according to the system that we have with insurance and such. Other changes, so section 48 abolishes the requirement that an evaluation team evaluates a person who's under court ordered admission in a mental health facility um, or required to receive assisted outpatient treatment before the person could be unconditionally released before the expiration of the order. Right now that does not happen and every all the stakeholders thought that that was an unnecessary step. Section 23.5 updates the term professionally qualified in the field of psychiatric mental health. Uh, so the term is usable for both public and private. This allows us to have a shorthand term for that type of person as opposed to continuing to list out all of the people that would be able to fit under that term. Section 3.5, we applied the term consumer to the entirety of NRS 433A so that we could take a step in again, trying to be on the same page with definitions. And then uh, we closed a loophole uh, prior to SB 70, what's in current law, is that it was only courts would seal records, they were mandated to seal records in cases of court ordered admission, um, but not for all these other people that are in the system um, and they're still going to court. So there would be a person that could go to court, have their case heard and the court would deny it. And there was no mandate that the court would seal that record. Um, and there's other cases like that. So we just wanted to make sure that uh, there was unique or um, there's standardized privacy across the board. For assisted outpatient treatment. So that's that court ordered outpatient treatment. Uh, these programs were written into law in 2014 and they were specific programs funded by SAMHSA, the federal funding uh, arm for mental health. And they were kind of unique programs, one in Clark and one in Washoe. And we had a technical assistance provider come and tell us that it's actually a generic kind of mechanism of treatment across the board. These are not specialized programs. So we really worked to develop a law that allows for that generic use in all counties, not just Washoe and Clark. Um, we also had an interesting part of Nevada law it was the only state that first required that the patient meet criteria for inpatient hospitalization and then, then meet AOT cri criteria. So basically the courts needed to find that someone was a danger to self or others before ordering them into outpatient treatment in the community. Um, and so we really made some improvements in this with the criteria so that people are able to see the specific criteria in the population that this uh, court ordered treatment would fit. So the proposed solutions are sections uh, 11 through 21, 20.5, 24, and 43, develops assist specific assisted outpatient treatment criteria and program um, protocols, procedures, and clarifies and updates at current law for implementation in all counties. It creates a separate AOT process. So the AOT process was interwoven into the inpatient process. So now it's very easy to read and understand. Um, and then section 42 moves, you would, you'll see that there's this requirement that the same council must continue to represent the person. We moved that piece into the AOT section as well. So again, it's in one uh, cohesive format. Oh, just a sec, here we go. Uh, AOT continued. So like I was saying, uh, we created a generic term. We think that this creates a clear and transparent process so individuals know what AOT is and how to petition for the program. 
It enables community providers to provide AOT services in coordination with courts. So in my region, we have CCBHC, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Those uh, agencies are able to provide the services of AOT. So it's possible for us to expand assisted outpatient treatment, uh, at least to my region and to other regions that have CCBHCs without needing state funding. Um, and then, like I was saying, it clearly identifies the target population. So instead of just saying the person is a danger to self or others, you know, the person is over the age of 18, has a mental illness, has a history of poor compliance, and really even has like basic outcomes that the person needs to meet, that they've been hospitalized, receiving services on a behavioral health unit, detention facility for 48 months, et cetera. And the last one, is that the person must be capable of surviving in the community in which he or she resides without substantial likelihood of serious harm to himself or herself or others uh, if they receive AOT. So that was AOT. Conditional release um, is another mechanism that provides kind of a level of care in the community that we're working for. So there's individuals in inpatient psychiatric units. Uh, I used to work on one as a discharge planner where you get them stabilized. They're no longer a danger to self or others. They're under court ordered admission, but you know that without necessary supports that they're going to deteriorate when they leave. Um, and in those situations, it's hard to discharge because that's essentially kind of an di unsafe discharge. Uh, and so many hospitals may decide to keep that person until the end of the court ordered admission, and they still haven't really found a great solution. And so that person is discharged with not great supports and ends up um, deteriorating as uh, su suspected would happen. Um, and so what this mechanism creates is kind of a discharge plan on steroids, where the hospital, if the individual is still under um, inpatient court ordered involuntary admission can try the individual out by coordinating with a team in the community um, and having the individual agree to certain terms such as you know you're going to go to treatment this community team is going to um, you know check in with you uh, and we're really going to try to create a warm handoff into the community and then the hospital can provide that information to the court and this is really important in a place like Clark County because they have 20 hospitals down there. You have people that are constantly going all through those hospitals and there's really just like a whole bunch of recreating um, the wheel in every discharge plan, every treatment plan. So the court can serve as a central entity in being able to coordinate that care. So if that individual comes back in, the court can say, this is what the last uh, discharge team or treatment team said worked. Here are the medications and be able to provide that to the next hospital for continuity of care. Uh, if the individual is looking like they're starting to deteriorate, the community organization that's working with the individual can come to the court and at least inform them of the deterioration that's happening. So we're really trying to create another um, supported level of care in the communities. So sections 22, 39, and uh, 47 clarify and update the conditional release process. This was already in the law. It was completely unworkable. And we think that having more court or oversight will provide more due process for the individuals. For the youth mental health crisis hold, like I was saying, um, they were using inaccurate terms when the law was written. Um, and it, the way that the law was written also, it was saying that, you know, hospitals have to notify the parents of the youth being detained on a hold after 24 hours after emergency admission. It's hoped that the youth would never be admitted to an inpatient psych facility without parent consent or knowledge um, or without some other due process. And so we thought that what it's really trying to say is hospitals have to notify the parents 20, within 24 hours of the placement of the hold. So we just made small changes like that. Uh, so section 33 clarifies and changes the time hospitals detaining a youth must, must notify a parent or legal guardian holding a youth under mental health crisis hold from 24 hours to eight hours. That was a big request from um, the family advocates. And we thought that that was reasonable on the hospital perspective because that's the first thing that you should be doing 
as a hospital if a youth is coming in without a parent. Uh, Section 35 also creates a mechanism for youth to be released from a mental health crisis hold to parent custody if the guardian or, guardian or parent agrees to treatment or accepts physical custody of the youth. Right now, there's no place on the form for that, so we wanted to create uh, that option and mechanism. And then finally, chemical restraint. I think everyone sees chemical restraint and probably is concerned about it. Um, but basically, Nevada's chemical restraint definition was developed in 1975 and is outdated and doesn't take into account for innovations, new medications, and new FDA approved uses of medications in healthcare. Uh, and so the solution was in sections 265, 66, 68, where chemical restraint is used exclude modern FDA approved interventions for treatment from the definition of, of chemical restraint. Um, and so this was proposed by Dr. Raven with Division of Public and Behavioral Health, and he worked closely with uh, Dr. Um, shoot, I'm so sorry, I'm blanking on that, uh, with the Commission on Behavioral Health, the chair of the Commission on Behavioral Health. Um, so we feel like that's a pretty vetted, a very vetted idea. All right. And with that, uh, I think we're at the end of the slides and I'm happy to accept questions if you have any. Thank you, Ms. Flood. Um, I know that Assemblywoman Titus has arrived, and I know that she wanted to, she sits on the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Board, and so I believe she had a brief um, presentation also in support of Senate Bill 70. So I will turn that over to you, Assemblywoman Titus. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. My apologies for being late at the start of this committee. Um, and brief, anything I would say would be brief compared to what our wonderful coordinator has to offer. Um, and she's just been stellar, so thank you, Jessica. Those of you who already know me, I'm Raman Titus, District 38, and yes, I have sat on this board now for two sessions. I assume that uh, Jessica gave you, or Ms. Flood gave you an overview of what this board does. Hopefully that's been done already. There are now five boards that uh, all have representatives from the legislature on these boards. I happen to sit on this one. Um, those who are on this committee know, especially uh, Majority Leader uh, Teresa Beatings Thompson know that we have been working literally for many, many, many sessions on what we know as the original Legal 2000 hold, now with the mental health crisis hold, trying to fix this statute. The ultimate goal was to make sure that, number one, a person had their rights upheld. Number two, they got medical and mental attention in an expeditious manner. And number three, then they also were able to get treatment. So along these many, many sessions, we tried to identify where the hiccups were uh, on this. And one of the goals was to make sure that in the, we heard testimony over the years about they would be stuck in an emergency room because they need this medical clearance or medication and where do you send them and what this process is. So. Um, hopefully, uh, we have worked on this. I would give credit to Ms. Flood because what she did was engage every single aspect of this large, large bill, not just from the medical aspect, which is what we would get hung up on, but also the judicial aspect and whether it was in the rules or whether it was in urban areas, whether it was a little hospital or a big hospital. So the key is trying to look at what the needs were throughout the state, making sure patients uh, in mental health crisis were treated both from a medical aspect and making sure at the same time their legal rights were upheld. And with that, I just want to, again, thank um, you for hearing this bill and appreciate uh, Ms. Flood and uh, uh, Taylor Allison, our, our chair of our um, our committee, so um, and happy to have any questions. And definitely the uh, experts uh, on this matter is sitting behind me on this video screen, I will tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Titus, and thank you, Miss um, Flood. Um, I know in talking with many of the stakeholders that you have spoke with that you guys were often meeting 
weekly, if not twice a week throughout the entire pandemic to make sure that you were incorporating all those stakeholders. And so um, that reputation um, obviously precedes your presentation here today. And with that, I will look around to see if we have any questions from committee members. I believe we have Assemblywoman Thomas. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation. I do appreciate it, um, Ms. Flood and um, Assemblywoman Titus. Um, I have clarification uh, questions, and there, there are several. One is, are hospitals equipped to handle the mentally ill or people that they suspect that are um, mentally ill? Um, I know that we have in the South several uh, mental health um, uh, private facilities that can assist because that's what they do. And where the hospitals, it seems like they are not zeroing in on just that subject. Thank you. Uh, if I might, Madam Chair, I'll start with that and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Ms. Flood to um, cover some additional thing. But I would say no, the hospitals... We're not. Assemblywoman oh, Titus, sorry. can you state your name, Assembly please? Assemblywoman Titus, for the record. Um, I would say that they absolutely were not, which is what was critical to another piece of legislation that we don't frequently refer to when we're doing one bill, but we passed the crisis stabilization centers, which were absolutely critical to, to, to looking at the overall mental health of our state. Because we, one thing we identify is we don't have adequate mental health throughout our state and uh, our little hospital where I practice forever, a little eight bed hospital, we don't have a mental health area that we could actually stabilize patients in mental health crises. So that was a component that we're addressing throughout the state. Um, we're getting better at it, but this bill addresses that. This bill says, what do I do in the ER in my little rural area? How long were patients sitting in a big urban emergency room that maybe didn't have access to adequate mental health within that? Because we weren't mental health centers. and so. Partly, we're trying to address that this legislation with some stuff we've already seen here. So, and then, uh, Ms. Flood. Yes, yeah, Jessica Flood, for the record. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, as Dr. Titus said, we're really trying to uh, develop that alternate behavioral health crisis response system. Uh, that 988 legislation, the crisis stabilization unit, is pretty amazing watching that be built. But I think we have acknowledged that hospitals largely cannot respond to mental illness. Uh, and so creating those crisis stabilization centers and a crisis call line is essential to being able to uh, adequately respond to people that are in mental health crisis. Thank you. Follow up, Chair? Go ahead. Thank you. So if I'm understanding this, once that person is admitted to the ER and they know that this person is basically unstable, um, are they transferred to another facility that actually can um, give them the help that they actually really need without a court order? So uh I'll start just with that if I might. Like I'll start with that. Thank you, Jessica. Robin that. Titus, for the record. So just for the process, um, when we start a mental health hold, there has to be a medical screening before they get admitted to the medical facility. And that's where our ER would come in. That's where they would bring them to me. I have to evaluate them, that make sure that their mental health crisis is not due to a medical reason. Uh, is their blood sugar low? Did they stop some medications or some other medical reason before then? yeah, this is a mental health issue. Then at that component in time, once we've cleared them medically, then we can't release them until we have an accepting facility. And so that's that warm handoff, as Ms. Flood had mentioned, that's a critical component to that. And, and having access to a bed, for example, there would be a waiting time where they'd stay in our ER literally for days until we could get them into a facility. And that's part of why we're trying to, that's part of why this board was even created because of those kind of issues, because there wasn't a place where we could do that handoff. And so they ended up sitting until a bed was available. So uh, Ms. Flood, do you have anything additional on that? Uh, just to add, uh, Jessica Flood for the record, just to add that a court order is not always necessary. Um, sometimes people can be on a hold, uh, and if they voluntarily want to go into a facility, that hold can be discontinued, or if the crisis ends, the hold can be discontinued. 
Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in the system. And the goal, like I was saying before, is people are going to hospital ERs, but eventually they can go to holds on these crisis stabilization units. Um, and in my region, we have Mallory Crisis Center that definitely works as that psychiatric ER. Thank you. And another uh, follow-up, Chair, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, when you were referring to um, item number three, um, the conditional ho uh, release, I believe that's what it was that you, you mentioned. And I was trying to understand how the courts are playing in the role of assessing whether or not the person is deemed um, um, a bit, uh, a deemed, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Um, release, you know, because I don't understand that where a doctor can actually, you know, a psych, a psych, a psychological, I'm sorry, um, I'm spitting words out right now, but um, a, a doctor can determine whether or not this person is able to be released, but yet and still the courts have to um, give permission. That's what I was understanding during your presentation. Uh, Jessica Flug, for the record, thank you for your um, question so I can clarify this. So the courts don't give approval for that discharge. The hospitals do decide the discharge. Um, and really the courts are just notified uh, that the conditional release has occurred. And they'll get that form that the hospitals have done with the community providers so that they can kind of be that central repository of coordination. So there's no approval from the courts. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Krasner. Thank you, Chair Wynn. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I appreciate uh, the antenna of the bill. I just have a, a, quite a lot of questions. Um, so an involuntary mental health crisis hold, you know, first of all, the word involuntary scares me. Um, here, obviously, in the United States, we value our individual rights and liberties under the Constitution, our freedom of movement. So involuntary hold, you know, it should give all of us pause. Um, and I understand there's people who really are going through a mental health crisis and, and, and who really do need this. But as legislators, we always have to be thoughtful and think about an odd case or a worst case scenario when somebody is taken against their will on this involuntary mental health crisis hold for 72 hours and really doesn't belong there. Uh, so my first question is, uh, at every point along the way during the 72 hour extended hold and if somebody decides that they're gonna go for an extended hold, does that individual have the right to petition the court for release or at least a hearing? That's my first question, please. Great, thank you so much, Jessica Flood, for the record. Uh, yes, so they do. We have a habeas corpus in NRS 433A where the, the individual can petition the court at any time. And actually that was why we started this work in the first place uh, is that the, the law is not well understood. And so patients were not really able to understand what their rights were. Um, and so prior to AB 85, uh, we, the hold started at this very ambiguous time after medical clearance. So you could be held against your will for you know, eight hours and you'd be like, okay, when does my 72 hours end? And they'd say it hasn't even started until after medical clearance. So that was pre 2019. Um, we clarified all that so we could start creating education. And that pamphlet that I showed you talks about your right to go to the court at any time uh, and uh, have a hearing on that. There's also the Nevada Disability and Advocacy Law Center that works on, or, or that's able to um, advocate for individuals with mental illness in those situations, and then the ACLU. So those are definitely why those uh, pieces are in place, but there is due process for anyone who requests it. Oh, thank you for that follow-up, Chair. Go ahead. Uh, well, I certainly appreciate that. Um, 
does the is the person is the adult or child given notice that they are entitled to a phone call within three hours uh, in, in NRS section 171.153, uh, a person who is arrested, again, they are, their liberty is taken away, their freedom of movement, uh, the law states they must be allowed to make a phone call or, or more than one reasonable phone call that's a uh, local phone call within three hours. In your bill, I don't see that, and I really think that should be added. I, I'd sure appreciate it, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, allowing somebody uh, to be notified that they can make a phone call, whether it's an adult or a minor, within three hours of the time they are taken against their will. Your thoughts on that, please? Yes, thank you. Jessica Flood, for the record. So in NRS 433A, um, we, the patient does have right to access the telephone, not even just within three hours, but during their entire stay at a hospital. So when we created that brochure, I would love to share that with you. It has all of these rights listed out in there. Um, I, I, I'd be open to your thoughts if we needed to add the three hours, but I think just, um, even just having that blanket access to telephone through the entire stay is really important. Thank you. And, and, and another follow-up. Uh, so also in your presentation, did you state that uh, your recent addition is that a minor now, a person under 18 who is taken involuntarily, uh, it's no longer going to be within 24 hours that the parent or guardian must be notified. It's going to be within eight hours. Did you know, did you state yeah. that? Well, that's, that's a that's good start. Right. But as a mom, if I didn't know where my child was for eight hours, I'd be in a, a huge panic. And so I feel it is so important that for a minor especially, they are allowed within three hours to make phone calls to a parent, a guardian, a friend, a grandparent, somebody. Because in NRS 171.153, if we are allowing someone who's been arrested to have that right, we certainly should allow a child to contact a parent, a guardian, a trusted friend, you know, a grandparent, yeah. somebody. I, I just feel so strongly that that should be included in this. And I appreciate all your hard work. I know I'm just bringing up nuances, but it, just as a parent, I just feel that it's so important that we have that language in here. It, it, your thoughts on that, please? Thank you, uh, Jessica Flood, for the record. I think your request is reasonable. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, as a hospital, like I said, it should be happening as soon as a child comes in. If law enforcement brings a child in, you'd think the first thing the hospital would want to do is try to get a hold of that parent. Um, you know, with this diverse stakeholder group, there's a lot of push and pull and tension, correct? So there's got, there's the hospitals that are like, ah, oh, is that gonna, are there these situations where we won't be able to do that? And then you have the parent and family advocates who say it should be like you said, within three hours. Uh, I think that's reasonable. I, I don't know what the stakeholders think about that, um, but I, I would be open to seeing what the stakeholders think about that. <laughs> that's kind of a vague response. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> Assemblywoman Krasner, I will ask you to probably follow up with her. I know that she is speaking on behalf of you know, her position as a coordinator for the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator. So she probably has a difficult time um, answering that on behalf of all of the um, stakeholders that she has been speaking with. I, thank do you have you. any other follow-up yeah. questions? Yeah, though? I do. And I appreciate that. Um, I just remember when this bill came in uh, that, that a minor could be taken with, you know, without consenting the parents or guardian and, and held for basically 23 hours and, and, and 59 minutes without notifying their parent. Uh, one of the directors of a local youth mental hospital reached out to me and said they were mortified by the bill and that they thought it would further traumatize children to not allow them to have that kind of contact or make a phone call uh, with a parent or guardian. So just for the record, I wanted to see if, if we could put that in there. Since we do give that to people that are arrested, I thought we could also give that, that same uh, right to to people who are taken against their will. Thank you. Yeah, Jessica Flood for the record. 
I think Assemblywoman Chair Wynn, I really appreciate that because yeah, this has been a group effort with probably 30 stakeholders. And so I just don't want, I have my own personal opinions on whatnot, but you know, in terms of the agreement and the process that we've put in, uh, I don't wanna just agree to something because I'm here and not all of them. But on the other hand, I think that that's very reasonable to think about three hours. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions for you, Ms. Flood or Assemblywoman Titus. Um, I know that a lot of work went into trying to do this during the 2019 session, and a lot of the work in Senate Bill 70 kind of plays off of the corrections and the clarifying language that was needed to further implement some of that um, those protections for patients um, as well, you know, within the legal system as well as within their medical care. Um, you had mentioned back to the um, telephone access. The way I read it is um, they have access to the telephone to make those kind of calls and make those requests for a hearing at any time, you know, whether it's in the first five minutes of them, you know, coming into contact with the system um, or if it's, you know, three hours later or four hours later. Is that correct? Jessica Flood, for the record, that is correct. And I'm looking around. Do we have any other questions from committee members at this time? Seeing none at this time, I will open up testimony in support of Senate Bill 70. Um, I will start in the room here with testimony in support. I would ask members to please clear um, people testifying to please clearly state and spell your name for the record and please limit your testimony to two minutes and we will have two at the table at a time and we'll begin when we're ready. Thank you, Chair Nguyen, uh, members of the committee for the record. My name is Katie Ryan, um, K-A-T-I-E-R-Y-A-N, and I'm the System Director of Government Relations for Dignity Health St. Rose Dominican. Um, I have provided the committee with a letter um, on the record and support and just wanted to um, let everyone know that we've been a grateful partner in this process um, and, and very grateful to Ms. Flood for all of the work she put into this. Thank you. Good afternoon, Kendra Birchie with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I also want to thank all the stakeholders for meeting with our office to try to address the due process concerns that we had, and more importantly, for continuing to work on this extremely important area of law. Just by way of context, my office represents those individuals who are involved, the adults, in the involuntary commitment hearings. And in 2020, we had 2,185 individuals who went through that process. So we appreciate the work that's been done in the last session and the continued on here to work on um, reworking our antiquated statutes in attempts to clear up the ongoing systematic issues and provide clarity for parents, patients, and hospitals about the requirements. And just um, to address Assemblywoman Krasner's question, I'm happy, Ms. Flood, to work with you to see if there's anything else that needs to be done to ensure that everyone understands that they do have rights to reach out to their parents or loved ones so that everyone knows where they are located. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And do we have anyone else in the room to testify in support of Senate Bill 70? Um, seeing no one coming up to the table. Broadcast services, if we can go to the line. Again, I'd remind callers on the line, this is testimony in support. Please clearly state and spell your name and limit your testimony to two minutes. To testify in support of Senate Bill 70, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 548. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller, please press star six to unmute. A M H A L L, represent, representing Nevada Rural Hospital Partners. Here in support of SB 70. This is an important uh, clarification in our statute in keeping the law aligned with current clinical practices and clear verbiage that will assist patients, family members, providers, first responders, as well as the judicial system when caring for patients who are in crisis. This bill has had tremendous time and expertise expended to assure 
that it is a well vetted product. And I'd like to thank all those that were involved in this process and appreciate your passage of this bill. Thank you. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. At this time, I will start testimony in um, opposition to Senate Bill 70. If there's anyone in the room, please make your way to the table. Seeing no one, broadcast services, is there anyone on the line in opposition? To testify in opposition to Senate Bill 70, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. I will start testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 70. Is there anyone in the room to testify in neutral? Seeing no one headed to the table of broadcast services, is there anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral to Senate Bill 70, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. And at that, I will turn this back over to Ms. Flood and Assemblywoman Titus for any brief closing remarks. Jessica, do you, Ms. Flood, do you have anything before I go? Okay, so. No, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, Assemblywoman Titus, for the record, I appreciate the committee hearing this bill. This has been literally a decade plus in the making, trying to refine what we accomplished um, last session in AB 85. Um, it, nothing is ever perfect, which is why we come back all the time for this, but I think that it's been really a, a collaborative effort with many stakeholders throughout this process and would appreciate you supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, um, Assemblywoman Titus. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 70. And at this time, I will open the bill hearing on Senate Bill 158. I believe that we have Ms. Block here to present. Senate Bill 158. I think this might be her first bill presentation. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Going to knock it out of the park. Um, <laughs> I will let you begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jillian Block, representing the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. Amy Hanadal, representing the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, is on the Zoom uh, with us today and will be available for questions. And I will start with just a brief overview of this bill. Uh, Senate Bill 158 is based on recommendations that came out of the Interim Child Welfare Committee. I would like to thank Senator Orenshaw for bringing this legislation forward. SB 158 amends NRS 432B.623, which concerns the Kinship Guardianship Assistance Program, or KINGAP. The KINGAP program provides financial assistance to a relative who becomes the legal guardian of a child in foster care. Currently, a child's relatives are only eligible to receive financial assistance through the program if adoption and reunification have been ruled out as permanency options. Basically, that means that even if it is not determined to be in the best interest of the child, as long as reunification or adoption are technically out there as an option, the relative caregiver would not be eligible for funding. SB 158 will revise this requirement so that instead of requiring ruling out adoption and reunification, a child welfare agency can determine that being returned home or adopted are not appropriate permanency options for the child. This is a small change to the law that would ensure that the state law is not more restrictive than federal requirements and which would expand opportunities to utilize federal dollars and ensure more permanency for kids. The language matches the federal 4E eligibility language, so we're not being overly restrictive with who can access federal dollars because there's a technical legal difference between not possible versus not appropriate. Maintaining family, community, and cultural ties is important for children. Adoption may not always be the best option. A child might have a strong relationship with a relative guardian. Parents may not wish to terminate their parental rights. Parents, uh, the parents and the guardian may have a good relationship too, and placement with relatives may allow a parent and a child to remain in contact. Subsidized kinship guardianship is a way to offer families another choice to help get, get children into supportive permanent placements. And SB 158 expands opportunities for federal funding, gives families more options, and provides more permanency for children. And with that, Ms. Hanadal and I are available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Block. I believe we have a couple of questions here. I'll start with Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this bill forward. I, I think it is important. I just had a question specific to the bill itself on Section 1, um, Number C, 
and it talks about the one line where services must, must determine that being returned home or adopted are not appropriate permanency options for the child. Would that eliminate this family member from adopting the child? Thank you for the question. Jillian Block for the record. I will let Ms. Hanadal elaborate on this, but um, no, this should just um, make it so that the uh, more restrictive language in the uh, NRS is not controlling here and that it will match the federal language. But I'll let Ms. Hanadal uh, follow up. Thank you, Ms. Hanadal. It's always nice to see you. Um, please state your name for the record before you speak. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Honadell. It's spelled A-M-Y-H-O-N-O-D-E-L. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, so I'm representing youth in foster care. And if I may just go ahead and answer Assemblywoman Titus's question. No, it does not eliminate adoption as an option for these families. Um, the way the amendment is written, adoption will still be on the table and actually it's best practices for us and the courts to do what is called um, concurrent planning so that two plans may be worked with the idea that we don't have to wait for one to be eliminated to get a youth out of the system. But there are times when adoption may not um, be what the child desires if they're an older youth, for example, but no, adoption would still be on the table. Uh, it just um, it would also be useful in a case where uh, a parent may not want to relinquish their rights and the evidence isn't concrete to terminate their parental rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarification. I just wanted to make sure it was still, it's on the record that the intent was not to totally eliminate an, uh, adoption as an, as an option for this child or the children. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. No problem. Do we have any other questions from committee members at this time? Go ahead, Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, um, Ms. Block, for bringing this uh, bill forward. Um, and I, I have a vested interest in it. Uh, number one, I visited the facility in, um, uh, actually, it's in North Las Vegas. And one of the things that I had a conversation about, um, I have I had a relative that actually had to take on her three um, grandchildren because the mother had died and um, she did not receive any help from the state in order to take care of these children and um, uh, meaning that if I would have taken the children I could have received um, foster care monies and I'm hoping that this bill will eliminate because this was a grandparent or an aunt or, you know, a relative, that that relative can actually receive monies from the state. Is this what is happening with this bill? Thank you for the question. Um, I'll actually let Ms. Hanadal speak to that as well because she has a lot more familiarity with this program. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is Amy Hanadel for the record. Um, this actually all relatives are eligible for financial assistance when they take uh, children in they are able to become licensed foster parents, uh, there is a shortened class requirement it's called a, a kinship licensing this bill doesn't affect that uh, what we are hoping to do. Um, going forward in other areas is to best, you know help with. Uh, the Department of Family Services, DCFS, um, Washoe, I believe, will also be working on this, is that making sure that relatives are given uh, information very early on, because it is a significant financial undertaking when they take on relatives' kids. But this bill won't affect that. Um, this bill, in fact, requires those relatives to become licensed before we do, before the case does get referred uh, for kinship guardianships. The, uh, the goal is though that the initial investigators are telling these relatives you can become licensed as a foster parent, as well as identifying what other social service help there will be. Okay, um, I'm not fully understanding that because it just seems like there is um, maybe misunderstanding on my part that um, a grandparent because they either have to adopt that child or um, reunify with the parent that um, they would 
receive assistance. And thank you again for the record. This is Amy Hanadel. Yes, I'm, I'm a little confused about where the confusion is coming from. Right now, the way um, Title IV funding and the foster uh, licensing programs are written and prepared, any person, relative or non-relative, can become a licensed foster parent to take care of kids. Ideally, at the beginning of a case when children are removed from their home, uh, they do better with family law, requires a preference for family placement. The social worker or case manager who's doing the placement should be advising these people, whether it's a grandparent or uh, another relative, of the availability of licensing for them to provide a financial subsidy to them. But the bill that is before uh, this committee actually does not affect that. It does contain, however, a requirement that anyone who does this get licensed and the kids are in the home with that person for six months prior to the time the guardianship is granted. So it, it, it forces the conversation. But in the case that um, you are referring to, that, that grandparent would have been eligible from the beginning, but it's not affected by this bill. Okay, thank you. So I do understand you saying now that um, in order for that grandparent, I'm sorry, Chair, follow up. I You're fine. Go ahead. Um, um, that the grandparent or relative would need to be a foster, a licensed foster care per person in order to receive assistance from the state. And that is, again, Amy Hanado, for the record, that is correct. And that is regardless of what the plan is for the child. Uh, it, it's, the child can be going home can be adopted, um, that doesn't affect that relative's eligibility to become licensed. So, you know, there's short past requirements to become licensed because we want these people to be supported when they have this um, unexpected, um, you know, ask to take care of children that are in their family. All right, thank you. Do we have any other um, questions? Go ahead, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one more point of clarification. I see that in order to become a licensed foster care person, there's a referral to NRS 424.030. Um, what is the timeline on this? Um, I'm not the only one it happened to me on the floor. Hey, and I didn't even know how to turn it off. I was so embarrassed. Thank you, CH. Okay. Not the only one. Okay. It's the last week of session. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. And it sounded good, too. So um, when, you know, a lot of these things happen so quickly, right? They could be death. It could be anything, right? Um, how much time, right? I mean, just... As an, as, as an example, I, I'm, when I leave here, I work full time, right? Where do I find the time to become this licensed foster care person? And if I'm getting my licensing under NRS 424.030, is there online classes? Do I have to go someplace? Um, if I don't do it fast enough, are you gonna take my grandbaby from me? I mean, how, how does this work and, um, and I mean, this is so scary, right? This is really scary. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey Bordelin, for the record. Um, yeah, it's a scary process for everyone involved. Uh, so I, I want to pull back a little bit. KinGap is a federal assistance program for to assist financially families who are relatives who take in their children for the foster care system. Um, I believe the agency works with you and works around that timeline because we do have a preference for working with family members in the law, right, to ensure that we're putting children with their relatives whenever possible. So Amy may be able to add to what that timeline realistically looks like. But what I'll say is what this bill is fixing, to put a, a, a finer point on the question you are asking Assemblywoman Thomas, is uh, everyone could agree right now in the state of Nevada in a child's child welfare case that the most appropriate placement is to have this permanency plan of guardianship with a relative. And so that's why we have this federal KinGap program, 
because a lot of families can't afford to just pull back and have no financial assistance and have the case closed under a guardianship with grandma. She, she needs that financial assistance. So the federal King Gap program that exists closes that loophole by providing that funding, but the way that we currently have interpreted that eligibility standard in the NRS is more restrictive than the 4E federal funding actually requires us to be. So by saying not possible, we have cases where it becomes a legal debate in the legal system as to what does not possible mean. And so everybody could be on the same page, the social services agency, the child social worker, the family members, the child wants this, everybody wants the permanency plan to close this case and be guardianship with grandma. But if it's determined that it's possible to adopt the child, then that could restrict access to that federal funding. And so by changing that to appropriate, it's where everyone agrees in the child's life that this is the best case forward, and we don't have to have legal arguments about it's possible for grandma to adopt, so if grandma wants the kids, she should adopt the kids, and that will come with an adoption subsidy. And we get into, um, in, in a narrow set of cases, we get into a legal argument that's unnecessarily restrictive just because of the way it's currently drafted in NRS. So this will allow us uh, to just, whenever it's possible and appropriate to get these families the federal funding, this slight tweak in the NRS will ensure that we're giving that those families that federal funding. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Bordelin. Um, so ju just to further clarify, this actually makes it a lot easier in situations that, like with Grandma, where Assemblywoman Thomas and Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong kind of mentioned. Bailey Borland, for the record, yes. I have a question from Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Thank you so much. And I think where one of the pieces might be coming in is I believe that there still is a, um, uh, the program is run through TANF, I believe. And so I, I want to say that there's a threshold of income. So for some people might not be eligible for it just because they, they're not meeting, I want to say it's uh, a certain percentage of poverty uh, 275 percent of poverty or so I think is what the qualifying guideline is so not just everyone who qualifies financially and is taking in uh, their relative or, or kin right and how we defined kin um, can get this but if there are people who are out there who aren't getting it it's just because there's that there's still an eligibility piece and so that might be a consideration for people who have incomes higher than what that federal poverty level is calling for on this and then also, I believe further down in the statute, there is language there on adoption saying that the enrollment in this program should not hold up or in any negative way affect the possibility of adoption down the road. And I think it says those adoption subsidies as well. And so I think that's important to know that when this was put in statute in 2011, there was a lot of consideration for that, that, that we didn't want to inadvertently create a financial incentive to kind of like have to choose a path to walk down, which is, do you want to do guardianship now and never adopt? Or we really want to leave all doors open for that, that child to have permanency with their family. So I think we've I think we've got that covered. I just know that in this bill, we don't see that piece of the, the statute in the chapter, but I believe, unless I'm wrong, that does still exist in statute. Bailey Bordelin, for the record, yes. Thank you, Majority Leader, for um, explaining that more artfully. So there, there are a lot of considerations that go into this. We're just in this bill looking at one consideration where we have found that uh, the NRS, in some cases, has just been interpreted to be unnecessarily restrictive. But you will still have to otherwise qualify for the program. But the unfortunate situation that we've seen happen is um, everyone agrees that grandma should take the child. And that is the plan. And that's what all parties involved want the plan to be. And so we've actually seen the guardianship be granted by the court as the permanency plan. But the kin gap federal funding has not been attached to it, which leaves grandma to have a financial hardship that in some cases will end up having that relationship um, no longer be sustainable and the child will end up back in the child welfare system. So uh, the funding is not necessarily indicative of whether or not the guardianship will be granted. It's just whether or not the guardianship will come with financial assistance. And so this will, in those cases, help the family members uh, have access to that additional support when appropriate and when they otherwise qualify through the program. 
Do you have any other follow-up? I, I could probably mention that I think the longest piece of becoming licensed is typically the fingerprint and background. So you're waiting for the, you know, that kind of process to play through. And it, I would say it'd probably be tricky to try to adjust that or undo that because it has all kinds of implications. But um, it can either be 90 days or three months, whichever comes faster. Thank you, Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Do we have any other follow-up questions or any uh, original questions from committee members at this point? Seeing none, I will begin testimony in support of Senate Bill 158. I will first turn to the room here. Um, I, we will take two at a table. If we could um, do so, I remind everyone to please clearly state and spell your name for the record and limit your testimony to two minutes. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Wynn and committee members. My name is Kendall Lyons. I'm the Director of Health Policy with Children's Advocacy Alliance. Uh, for the reasons that have already been stated, we already have our support on the record, but I just wanted to reaffirm that support here with you today. Good afternoon, Kendra Birchie with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. My op office represents the parents in those dependency 432B cases. We are in support of this legislation, and I'll just add and echo the statements from Ms. Bordelin of when I was a children's attorney, I had several cases where we had this issue where everyone wanted the grandparent or the relative, the aunt, uncle, sibling, to still have that child where it was best for the child to remain with a family member, but because the plan had to be guardianship and there was no financial support, that added a lot of angst and issues for the entire family. So I urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Nguyen, members of the committee, Joanna Jacob, on, be on behalf of Clark County. Uh, we worked with legal aid um, and stakeholders on this bill in the interim leading up to this um, legislative session. I did want to put on the record, Clark County, we have a large, um, we have a we have a great degree of our foster care kids with relatives and in relative placement. As of March 2021, I just actually pulled this while we were having this discussion, we had over 1,100 um, children who are staying with their relatives. It is a something that Clark County supports. I also did want to put on the record that um, really what we're talking about here is the subsidy and it was important to clark county that we have the language in this bill mirroring the federal 4e language so that we can get financial assistance to our relative placements um, we do need them to be in that placement you'll see in the bill that they have to be with that relative for six months um, and then during that time during we work with our relatives to get them licensed we do have expedited licensing pr procedures if the licensing is delayed, it delays the subsidy. It, we, it is not a situation where we would remove the child from that family placement. We do we want to avoid disruptions to the fullest extent that we want to. So I just wanted to say that for the record. Um, we appreciate Legal Aid's goal um, in, in working on this bill because of the language that was in the statute. There were some issues with how that language was being interpreted. And so that's what why we worked with them on this bill to mirror the federal 4E language, which will enable us to get the financial support to our families. And of course, um, to Assemblywoman Thomas, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, if you would like me to follow up with you about that process, especially if you have seen some issues in your communities, I'd be happy to do that after the hearing. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the room, broadcast services, if we can go to the line for testimony in support of Senate Bill 158. Just to find support of Senate Bill 158, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there is nobody in support at this time. Thank you, Broadcast Services. I'm going to the room for any testimony in opposition of Senate Bill 158. Seeing none, Broadcast Services, is there anyone on the line in testimony, um, in, on the line for opposition testimony? To testify in opposition to Senate Bill 158, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Going to the room now, is there any testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 158? Seeing no one running up to the table. <laughs> Broadcast services, is there anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral for Senate Bill 158, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Sure, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. And with that, I will call our bill presenter back up to the table for any closing remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just reiterate that this bill simply makes a small change to a narrow piece of the NRS to ensure that the eligibility requirements um, are not more restrictive than federal requirements and just creates and expands uh, more opportunities for, for families and children. So thank you so much for hearing uh, SP 158 today. Thank you, Ms. Block. At this time, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 158 and open the hearing on Senate Bill 175. I believe we have Senator Neal here to present Senate Bill 175. Welcome to Assembly Health and Human Services, and please begin when you are ready. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman and Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services. I am Senator Dina Neal, and I'm here to present SB 175. SB 175 is legislation that I brought forth on lupus. Um, I have been trying to tackle a couple of diseases that are considered invisible diseases. Last session, I tackled sickle cell. This session, I was going after lupus because it is one of the diseases that is hard to diagnose, and it is predominantly women and it is predominantly affecting women of color, Hispanic and African American. So I also have a co-presenter, I don't know if she's on, uh, she is over the Nevada um, Lupus Organization, uh, Miss Calvina Williams, I think she was supposed to be on Zoom, is she on? Because she's going to be a part of the... I am not sure if she is on the Zoom. If you are on the Zoom, if you can unmute yourself, we would know. <laughs> I am not seeing anyone, okay. so it is you All today. Right. That's <laughs> fine. All right. So um, there are a couple of uh, things in your, it should be in your exhibits. Uh, there was data around the emergency visits and inpatient admissions from Department of Health and Human Services, which gives you the specific data on Nevada. And then there was a second document that was uploaded for the National Public Health Agenda for Lupus, the blueprint. And so the reason why I put those two exhibits in there, because number one, the bill helps us to align with the national policy agenda around lupus. Number two, the lupus-related department visits, um, which break down uh, demographics and, and, and um, sex, and it lays out the um, number of visits, uh, roughly about 1,500 total visits of admissions, because this is the data that we currently have, and this bill would expand that data set and allow us to grow in terms of the variants that we would be able to identify. So getting into SB 175, so if you look at um, pretty much se sections 2 through 12 give definitions, but section 4 is super important because lupus and its variants are super important because there are four types of lupus, and so this bill would be able to get documentation on systemic lupus, cutaneous lupus, drug-induced lupus, and then neonatal, neonatal lupus, which actually affects newborns. Um, in Section 5, this lays out the duties of the chief medical officer and what they would be responsible for doing. The basic idea is we're creating a registry, and we're creating um, um, a system so that the record and the cases of lupus and its variants are reported to the state. Um, the chief medical officer is responsible for conducting a comprehensive epidemiologic survey of lupus, evaluating the appropriateness of the measures for the treatment of lupus and its variants. And then it also includes what hospitals and medical laboratories and other facilities, uh, how they are part of this reporting scheme because they are in the front line providing screening, diagnostic, and therapeutic services to patients with respect to lupus, and they shall report their information to the State Board of Health. And it also says in Section 5 that inter inter 
provider of health care who diagnoses or provides treatment for lupus and its variants, except for cases directly referred to the provider, must also report their information. When you get to Section 6, this is the prescription, which kind of lays out the information that is required to be kept. Uh, based on SB 175, so the State Board of Health shall, by regulation, prescribe the manner in which information will be maintained, basic name, address, age, and ethnicity of, of patient, uh, the variant of the lupus, the method of the treatment, without limitation, any opioid prescribed for the patient or whether or not the patient has adequate access to an opioid, and any other diseases in which the patient suffers. This, I want to just pause there for just really quickly, because the reason why um, the diseases are, are important is because there can be several offshoots. You can end up with a cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, rashes, painful joints, there's inflammation, um, fatigue, and some cognitive issues. When I met some patients over the summer, and in the presentation on the Senate side, there is a clear case of, um, based on the women, that they are being misdiagnosed when they go into the hospital. Uh, Ms. Calvina, if she would have been on, she had been in a situation where they believed that she was going in, she was having a stroke, and truly, if, if the doctors had had their way, they would have given her medication, which probably would have ultimately caused her death because what was really happening was that she was having a lupus-related incident that needed to be diagnosed, and it turned out that there was only one doctor who happened to pass her while she was laying in the hallway who then identified her symptoms and then was able to treat her, and then she is now living with us today. Um, I ran into women who, when they are encountering issues with their primary, well, really their rheumatologists, um, and there are only a few rheumatologists in the state, they are then challenged with the um, care model that is being presented to them because they're being told that they're not really sick, they don't really have lupus, but yet they've been diagnosed for 10 years. I just recently heard a story today of a woman who had been on uh, lupus medication for probably the past 20 years, then ran into her rheumatologist who then took her off of all medications and then placed her on Tylenol for her pain and inflammation, and Tylenol has the effect of uh, damaging kidneys of a lupus patient. And so she is now in a pickle because they are saying that she is a problem patient rather than listening to her and understanding that she knows her care better than anyone else and that she's trying to tell the doctor exactly what's going on with her, but yet he's not hearing her. And now she is in a state of panic because she needs to find another doctor who can take care of her, but she is worried about the absence of the medications because he removed those medications from her. And now she is on nothing and trying to figure out how she can tell her story to a physician um, and hopefully get over to a primary care physician that will help her uh, hopefully get back on her medications and manage care. So this is an invisible population. So it's very important that, number one, we document the method of treatment, which is in the sub-C in Section 6, and any other diseases that the patient suffers, and the information concerning the usage and access to the health care service by the patient. And that's key because they are running into roadblocks um, in terms of their access to health care and it being properly establish that they are lupus patients and not something else. Um, the bill continues to talk about the confidentiality, which is in such Section 6, Sub 3, that there will be a protocol established by the State Board of Health around the appropriateness for access to and preserving the confidentiality of the records of the patients needed for the research into lupus and its variants. In Section 7, the chief administrative officer of the health care facility shall make available to the chief medical officer or his or her rep um, information around the health care, each case of lupus and its variants. And the division then has the responsibility to abstract from those records um, information and compile in a timely manner 
what is going on with the lupus and lupus variants. It gives a uh, six months, not later than six months after the division, abstracts the information or receives the information from the healthcare facility. So there is a timeline. And section eight, this is the reporting and what the report shall be based on, which then re-references section five, six, and seven. And it talks about here the reports and what they will be based on. And so based on five, six, and seven of, of the bill, it makes it other appropriate uses of the information to report. It's very important because this section is going to assess the trends and the usage of and access to healthcare services by the patients with lupus and its variants in a particular area or population. It will also be important for this section to be applied because they will advance research and education concerning lupus. There are um, several organizations that are already in play on a national level. The CDC has actually been running um, uh, surveillance projects in a couple of other states. It would be nice if once we pass this bill and get aligned with the national standards that we could become a part of a surveillance project and actually start to be able to develop and lift up these patients so we can identify their associated uh, disorders and the variants and the access to care issues that they are facing. Um, further on in Section 8, if you look at A, B, and C, it lays out the information concerning the locations in which um, patients diagnosed with lupus, the demographics of those patients, the utilization, and then the information in paragraph A specific to patients diagnosed with lupus and its variants who are over 60 years of age, and the transition of patients diagnosed with lupus and its variants from pediatric to adults uh, upon reaching um, 18 years of age. This is important because the continuity of care is important for a young person who may have been diagnosed before 18 and what that continuity of care will be from rheumatologist to rheumatologist or if they come in from another state. This will also allow them to at least have some kind of connection to build that transition. This language was similar to an issue I dealt with with the sickle cell patients because they literally had a drop off at 18. And because of the drop off at 18, they had an absence of care between becoming an age of majority and then having to find their own health care. And then a primary care physician and therefore a rheumatologist who would then help them continue their medications and um, be able to manage their disease. In Section 9, the chief medical officer or any qualified person or designee shall analyze this information. And they'll analyze the information pursuant to Sections 5, 6, and 7. And then in Sub 2 of 9, the chief medical officer or designee will determine if there is a trend that exists in the usage and access of health care. And so this is important because it, it lays out that after they do that determination, that they are supposed to then work with appropriate government educational research entities to investigate the trend and advance the research in the trend and facilitate the treatment of lupus and its variants and associated disorders. In Section 10, it allows the division to apply for and accept grants gifts and donations to carry out the sections 2 through 12 and then it continues to discuss how they are going to coordinate and administer any other state programs related to lupus um, because I wanted to make sure that this bill tied them into any federal activity, any state activity that was going on and so that they were um, coordinating at every chance they possibly can with other states to move themselves ahead. And so with that, Madam Chair, I will open myself up for questions. Thank you, Senator Neal. Go ahead, um, Assemblywoman Titus, we'll start there. Um, thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, or Senator Neal. Um, do you need to take a big breath? Because you put through that presentation pretty fast. So I appreciate you bringing this forward, and I absolutely appreciate your passion and your caring for your constituents in all of Nevada. And so thank you for that. A um, couple technical questions on the bill itself. Um, under 
Section six, number, or I'm sorry, I apologize, section five, number three, when you mention hospitals, medical labs, and other facilities, provide screening, et cetera, you have to give that information unless uh, it's been done through somebody else. So how would they know that and to prevent some of this uh, double reporting? How, how, how will they know that it's already been um, provided? So Senator Dean Neal, for the record, that will be a key piece that I think the department will have to deal with right now for the data. We just are using the ICD-10 codes in order to identify whether or not they hit the emergency room or have inpatient. And so there is an absence of data. Um, and so this, this would be, the, this bill would help in refining and making sure that we're not double getting information because we don't have the full set of data that we need in order to do the analysis and to determine the access to care and the treatments around the variants. And so um, that's what I thought was unique. When I started um, looking, it had to have been last year because I know it wasn't in the summer, and I started asking, what data do you actually have on lupus and can you send me anything that you have from the biostatistician? And so, and this, that's why I uploaded what, um, what I did receive in the exhibits because we need to actually collect data. So I can't tell you that it won't be duplicated because we actually need to just get in the fray and find out what's there and then pull it from all of the areas and then do the analysis. And then from that benchmark, make sure that the standard of the information that's being recorded is actually just coming from those one entities. What I do know is that it's a small subset outside of the hospital because they either see the rheumatologist, and if they can't see the rheumatologist, then they see a primary care. Uh, follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. So uh, thank you for that. Um, as a primary care doc, family practice doc, I have seen many patients who thought they might have lupus or subsequently I diagnosed lupus. So it's not something that's just limited to to uh, women of color. I, I will say um, it is throughout the spectrum, and I've seen it in, in many different folks, but especially women. Um, but I would say they Getting into that rheumatologist is the X factor. You know, we have to do all these tests prior to, as you already mentioned, we have so few rheumatologists in the state. And before I could refer a patient, I'd have to send them all the stuff that I did, the tests that I ordered, using, and in order to use, to obtain a test or get permission from their insurance companies, I'd have to use an ICD-9 code to justify the test. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanted some clarification on, you know, how they're reporting, duplication of reporting, but certainly understand your comment that in order to even start, we have to have some sort of template to get started with the data, then we can maybe go through it later. Uh, next question, is there another, any other states that have this model? Would Nevada be the first state that does this, or are you using some other state's um, successes? So I... I pretty much built this bill off of um, my sickle cell bill, but they are doing it in California, and it's my understanding that they're also doing some work in New York, um, it, and I believe Georgia is one of the other states. Um, they, in 2011, Illinois passed uh, Lupus Education Awareness Act. Um, 2014, Georgia created a council on lupus for education awareness. So they've, they've done different variations, but they focus more. California has been the surveillance project that's been with the CDC, but Illinois and Georgia focus more on education awareness. And so I, I actually watched a couple of videos that the um, it was a representative in Georgia because she had lupus and then she took it on but they were doing more of an education piece. Our, this bill, 175, was really getting into that reporting and doing the registry, which I was trying to match with what California was doing. Thank you for that. Again, thank you for your passion, Senator Neal, and thank you for the questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we can go to Assemblywoman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Neal. Um, my question actually is just, you know, with the reports, um, I love the bill, and um, I don't know if it's appropriate. I would like to also be a co-sponsor on the bill. 
Um, I know that this is crunch time and probably won't happen, but for the record, I would just like to note that. But I also want to know, um, after all the reports are in, is there a way for the legislature to get the reports so that they just don't sit on somebody's desk and collect dust? <laughs> Senator Dina Neal, for the record, thank you for that uh, question. I, I'm going to do two things. I want to I want to acknowledge uh, Assemblywoman Titus because it is true that if you look at the data, uh, lupus affects 88 percent women. And to get to your question, uh, I have not considered giving it to the legislature because actually in the reverse, reports sit on the legislature's desk. <laughs> so no. So I have more interest in it actually going to the division where they are actually more engaged and more active in looking at the information because the way the bill is set up, you have the chief medical officer engaging in analysis and doing an assessment to determine trends. If it went to the legislature, you would see it as a report which there's many of reports that we have and unless you go specifically looking for it um, it has no value only to the person who is seeking it out um, I, and, I, and I won't and I'm not going to say this in a negative way because we do we do we tie ourselves to legislative reports because we believe the legislature is this esteemed body where people will be like oh my god if I do wrong the legislature knows about it well Unless you are totally engaged in making sure that that happens, meaning following your legislation to say, hey, you saw the report, you saw the data, and you didn't perform, and then act upon those agencies. That's the only value of the legislative report. You have to actually make what the legislature is, which is the esteemed body that it is, have the power and authority to then go to the other person and say, you have not responded to this data, and I need you to respond to this data. And so um, for now, I'm just going to keep it right here with the Health and Human Services Division. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. But I also had a, um, uh, a, a vested interest when uh, you mentioned neonatal lupus. I am very concerned about that. Thank you. And I will add you to my bill. Thank you, ma'am. I think all my bills just have me on there. Most people are just like, I'm not trying to touch uh, what Senator Neal is doing this session. <laughs> Um, Assemblyman Matthews. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, I appreciate the question from Assemblywoman Titus. I was sort of had some uh, curiosity along those same lines. I think you said in response that California is the state that's got a registry along these lines. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to you know, what are they doing with that information? Has it led to policy changes, policy changes um, in the works, um, any changes or improvements in health outcomes? I guess that would depend partially on how old uh, the registry is or how long they've been doing this. But I'm just wondering if you might be able to speak to um, what's occurred over there as a result of this. Thank you. So there, so there's a couple of things. So I'll start with this. So California attempted legislation uh, twice. A, they attempted in 2011, um, and then it didn't pass, and then they tried again in 2014. And then they got connected with the CDC. Um, and it's my understanding that the work that they've been doing, which is a part of the National Lupus Patient Registry, they have managed to um, get consecutive funding from Congress of about $9.5 million. Um, they have also managed to fund $10 million for a lupus research program in which the California and um, I believe Georgia is a part of the CDC surveillance project. And then in addition, in 2020, because of the work that's been happening where they've been giving the information to this uh, CDC and this national group, they've, been, they've managed to get $2 million um, for the lupus program at the Office of Minority Health. Um, it was an increase of over 750000 from the fiscal year 2020. And then in um, National Institute of Health was then given an increase of $1.25 billion, which is the largest public funder of research. And so since the work, it's my understanding, since the work of roughly 2014, um, they've been just building this national uh, lupus patient registry, and they've been able to leverage funding 
and um, create research programs in order to help other states. And so I wanted uh, SB 175 to become a part of this national work and that Nevada actually get in play. Um, I didn't find out that we were behind the times until I got this actual document from um, Director Whitley, who then told me that SB 175 aligned with 2015 agenda that around lupus work. And so I said, okay, well, it's 2021. Let's get in the game. We're six years behind and start playing in this national work. A uh, quick follow-up, Chair, if I may. Yes. Thank you, Senator. So it sounds like the, in, in terms of the initial consequences in California, it's resulted in access to additional funding, perhaps premature to say whether or not that's um, getting us on the road, presumably it would, but to, to improve health outcomes, um, changes in policy beyond that. We're kind of, they're kind of still in the phase of bringing in uh, assistance or financial funding for this at this point. Is that correct? Um, Senator Dina Neal, what I would say is that based on the Center for Disease Control, um, the latest report said that they were able to um, document 16,000 new cases per year. And I think that the registry has helped them to reach that 16,000 per year. And so I, I wouldn't say that they're in, they're in the forming stages because what they have they, they probably started in an infant stage around the 2014, 2015, and then they have successfully grown. I just want Nevada to be a player because we have a lupus population here that feels uh, like they're drowning and that they're, that they're not a part of the care. And the woman, uh, Miss Calvina Williams, has been, she created her own organization in order to do the work in Vegas. And she's doing it all on her own, just reaching out to women. But this gives her a chance to take the work that she did, sweat, blood, and tears, and to leverage it into the state and then hopefully into a national conversation to say that Nevada has lupus patients that need to be a part of the work. Appreciate that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we can go to Vice Chair Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's see, my, and thank you for being, bringing this bill. Um, we have a familial connection with lupus, and um, it is a pretty terrifying disease with the unknowns and some of the ways that it expresses itself. And I think um, the, the information around it is, is not super readily available, um, and it can be really scary in that diagnosis piece. Um, my question about the reporting expectations in the bill, um, I just want to clarify on the record, um, are you expecting that the reporting be defined through the regulatory structure? That's my understanding in, in the bill, and I just want to ensure that that's uh, Senator Dina Neal, for the record, yes, in Section 6, yes, it's by regulation. Okay, and then from there, are you expecting that the regulations will um, ask for reporting per case or on an annual basis, and by which provider, either the individual private provider or the, the facility in which the provider works? Um, just wanting to get on the record the, the intent there. So... Uh, the intent is to wherever, uh, like for the hospital, medical laboratories, or other facility that is either providing the screening, the diagnostic, or the therapeutic service, that they are reporting that information to the state board. That's the goal. Thank you. Uh, and uh, do we think that'll be like an annual thing, or is it more important to get it up front and, and, and see it as, it's hap as the diagnosis is happening? It's supposed to be happening upon when they go. And so that timeline of that six-month window, so they should be reporting. It's not annually, but they should be reporting when those cases come through, and then there should be a compiling uh, moment. So when I... You, that six-month uh, piece where it says the manner no later than six months, the division then abstracts the information, and then we have the analysis that occurs. So we're collecting, and then we're going to abstract the information, and then we're going to do the analysis to determine if there are trends. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions from members? Looking around, seeing none. At this time, I will begin testimony in support of Senate Bill 175. I'm going to look to the room. Uh, seeing no one coming up to the table at this time, broadcast services, can we go to the phone line for any testimony in support of Senate Bill 175? 
To testify in support of Senate Bill 175, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 313. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller, please press star six to unmute. Hello, this is Calvinia Williams, founder and president of Lupus of Nevada. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Go ahead with your testimony. Thank you so much. I was supposed to have been earlier, and I was trying to work with this phone and couldn't work with it. Uh, Senator Dean and Neil, thank you so much, and I'd like to thank uh, Health and Human Services. I, I, I'm just, I'm pleased. But one of the things I have lupus, and I have also lupus of Nevada, and our agency is advocacy and educational awareness. And one of the things, one of the things we want to see with the um, SB 175 is accountability. The reporting process in this, when our lupus individuals go, and this has been over 17 years in Nevada doing this, our lupus people will go into the doctors and they will come out with no answers, no answers at all. Um, the second thing I would like to have is the demographics of this. This is what we really wanted, you know to hold that accountable so the registry can get their hands on it and we can fight, we can actually fight to get those grants. But we don't know how many people in the state of Las Vegas, in Nevada, that has it. And our people are calling me daily, complaining about the fact that they went into their doctor, went to California, diagnosed 16 years, they moved here about six months ago. One of the physicians told them they didn't have lupus, took all their medicine away, and now they're... Uh, told them to get on um, Tylenol, that's it. We need accountability with this because if these individuals have been on their medications for 16 years, we need to figure out what's going on. We really do. And now this individual with lupus does not have any doctor. The doctor, she won't go see the doctor, so she's just out there. She's trying to find a primary there in, in Las Vegas now. And I get concerned about it and agitated because I'm a major advocate for this. And I, we need your help. And this bill is going to do it for us. It's going to set boundaries, standards, determined by the uh, misappropriation of the uh, diversity of the people that do have it on Revere, in West Side, uh, uh, the South, Southwest. A lot of people aren't going to the doctors because they're not going to get the outcome that they're expecting to get. So that's why I feel it's so important for this bill. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Broadcast services, do we have anyone else to testify in support? Chair, there are no more callers to testify in support at this time. Next, I will go to any testimony in opposition of Senate Bill 175. If there's anyone in the room, please make your way to the table. Seeing none, broadcast services, is there anyone on the line in testimony um, in opposition? Testify in opposition to Senate Bill 175. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition. And do we have any testifying, any, anyone testifying in neutral in the room? Seeing no one in the room to testify in neutral. I think we may have someone on Zoom. Do we have anyone on Zoom to testify in neutral? If you are here to testify in neutral on Senate Bill 175, I'd ask you to unmute and turn on your camera. People switch over from television to Zoom to wherever they are. <laughs> um, broadcast services, if we can go to the line to see if there's anyone to testify in neutral. To testify in neutral to Senate Bill 175, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you. And with that, I will call our bill sponsor up to make any closing remarks. Oh, 
Senator Dina Neal, for the record, I want to thank the committee for hearing SB 175. Thank you, Chair, for scheduling this bill. Um, if this bill gets out, it will do really good work uh, for patients that have an autoimmune disease that really want to have proper care and uh, transparency around their disease. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And with that, I will close the Senate uh, hearing on Senate Bill 175 and open the hearing on Senate Bill 318. Um, Senator Denote, I see you here present. Please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Chair Wen, and good afternoon to the members of the Assembly Committee on Health and Human Services. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, for the record, my name is Fabian Donate, and I represent Senate District 10 in the heart of Las Vegas. I come before you today to speak on Senate Bill 318, which makes various improvements in language access to services provided by our governmental agencies. Today's conversation on language access is something that is long overdue, and I am glad that I, we can be here to address a much needed gap that is always ignored until it is too late. COVID-19 has shown to us just how valuable information access can be for those who may not have the adequate education or resources to understand and take part of relevant health information. Failing to prioritize information access can result in public health disinformation and distrust, which is in direct alignment to an environment that could foster vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy, as in the refusal of vaccines despite the availability of these services, is a very real problem here in Nevada that will become apparent within the next few weeks, especially as we begin to expand our reach to marginalized groups that have been abused and neglected for years. In public health, we use the term health literacy to describe a person's ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others around them. Health literacy is an important thing to consider in developing programs that improve the community's health status, mostly because it acknowledges any present limitations and emphasizes the ability to use health information, not simply to just understand it. To make well-informed decisions, health literacy skills are needed. This means that the wide range of our population must have the adequate foundational knowledge of a health problem before even considering the implications that may arise. As legislators and public servants, the reality of this pandemic is that we have not done our best with how this response has taken shape, mostly because we didn't have the right infrastructure in place to carry out a good response. If we want to fix the disparities observed in communities of color, we have to take the right step to invest in a public health services that will achieve good outcomes. The biggest takeaway from today is that health literacy starts at the distribution of information and information is accessible when it is done in a culturally competent manner within your own native language. Your language is your culture and your culture can modulate your perceptions of what health can mean to you. With the permission of the chair, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Olivia Whiteley, the Western States Advocacy Officer from the Refugee Ad Advocacy Lab to give her remarks on the bill language and a brief rundown on the intended outcomes on SB 318. Thank you, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Senator and Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for hearing SB 318 and allowing me the opportunity to speak to this critical proposal. Um, my name is Olivia Whiteley and I'm the Western States Advocacy Officer for the Refugee Advocacy Lab. As the Senator mentioned, I will provide an overview of the development of this bill, components of the bill, and make a short remark um, related to the outcomes of the bill. Over the past several months, I have surveyed Nevada's resettlement agencies, and the number one shared concern of these agencies is language access, particularly for refugees that speak on common languages. Organizations that serve Nevada's refugees report the qualified interpretation and translation services are often unavailable as clients interact with the central state agencies and programs, such as small business support or the DMV. These barriers have been amplified with the onset of the pandemic as reliable, up-to-date public health information regarding the coronavirus is continually needed to enable refugee and limited English proficient Nevadans to protect themselves and their families. This bill was drafted based upon similar legislation previously introduced in other states, including Alaska, Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, California, Hawaii, Washington, Illinois, New Jersey, Virginia, and New Mexico, the Department of Justice's language access assessment and planning tool and feedback from local community groups. SB 318 has two primary components. First would be COVID relief provisions. SB 318 requires the Division of Public and Behavioral Health and each health district or department to record the preferred language of every individual that receives COVID-19 services, provide limited English proficient individuals with interpretation services either in person or remote, 
translate vital documents such as applications or notices related to COVID-19, translate governmental orders related to COVID-19, and collaborate with community-based organizations to ensure all local languages are represented. The requirements for language services are proportionate to the number and language of limited English proficient individuals served by the division or health district, ensuring that smaller health districts do not have to provide services in the same frequency or breadth as larger health districts. If a health district only serves individuals that speak Spanish, Arabic, and Hindi, that district only has to provide services in those languages. The Department of Public and Behavioral Health submitted a $0 fiscal note for SB 318 as they already have the requisite federal funds to implement the provisions of Section 2 and Sections two and sections 3 and 4, excuse me, which applied directly to district health divisions and departments are operative, quote, to the extent that money is available for these purposes, end quote, and intended to guide the appropriation of American Rescue Plan dollars. Senator Donate spoke artfully to the critical nature of these provisions. Second, SB 318 addresses language access for governmental services beyond COVID by requiring state agencies to create language access plans. Each executive agency's language access plan is required to include one, an outline of existing regulations and compliance, two, demographic information on individuals served by the agency, three, an inventory of current language services and training resources, four, a review of COVID language access measures, and five, estimates of additional funding, employees, and resources necessary to meet identified needs. SB 318 also requires a public comment period for the drafted language access plans to ensure that the voices of interpreters, translators, and English learner clients are adequately taken into consideration. One point to be clear on is that SB 318 does not require agencies to implement their language access plans, only to develop and revise the plans. Section 7.4 of the bill requires agencies to include implementation costs in their 2023-2025 budget requests, allowing the legislature to consider the full funding required for implementation during the next session. Following the initial amendment of the bill, which clarified the distinction between planning and implementation, many agencies eliminated or significantly decreased their fiscal note. SB 318 is a relatively low cost first step towards ensuring language access throughout the state. Currently, there is no state level standardized process for ensuring state agencies take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to eligible limited English proficient individuals. There is no relevant statewide requirement in the NRS and there is no mention of linguistic accessibility in the 2020 statewide administrative manual. This prohibits a significant amount of Nevada's population from accessing public goods, services, or benefits. According to data from the 2019 American Community Survey, between 10.7 and 13.8% of Nevada's adults and 5.8% of Nevada's children speak English less than very well. The implications of a lack of statewide guidance or resources can be found in the following case study. Within HHS, the Division of Child and Family Services has the most comprehensive set of publicly available language access policies, a limited English profession or LEP policy from 2017, and a culturally and linguistically appropriate services policy from 2018. These policies contain several components that are praiseworthy and that SB 318 would require of all agencies. However, even these policies are four to five years old and lack standardization. For example, the culturally and linguistically appropriate services policy defines an interpreter or translator as an individual who has, quote, a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution, preferably in languages or linguistics, and possesses at least one year of specialized experience, end quote, while the LEP policy has no such definition or qualifications requirement. As both policies are specific to the same program area within DCFS, children's mental health, this fundamental determination of who is competent to interpret or translate treatment options, eligibility requirements, or medical conditions to parents whose children are facing mental health difficulties should be standardized. If you look through other publicly available HHS uh, LEP policies, which are posted as an exhibit on Netlist, uh, you can see a further lack of standardization. Some of these policies are a single paragraph, some are not publicly available. Um, the agency or division an individual is dealing with should not determine an individual's ability to access essential information in their preferred language about programs not only are they eligible for, but are funded by their tax dollars, uh, nor should an individual zip code. It's possible and likely that agencies and other divisions have additional policies and plans and resources for ensuring language access that are not readily publicly available or otherwise included on Nellis. And this is not intended as a comprehensive evaluation of the existing language access work of Nevada's departments. But across the state agencies and departments we've spoken with, 
all have expressed a very strong desire to expand their language access offerings, but a general lack of resources to do so. Um, SB 318 provides a statutory basis for all agencies to include funding to support the implementation of their language access plans in their biennial budget request, which bridges the gap between agency intent and the resources available to each agency. My final remark, and perhaps my most important remark, is that SB 318 is a civil rights issue that underlines all other activities in this committee. One primary objective, if not the primary objective, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was to prevent the discriminatory use of public funds, ensuring that all who paid taxes were able to access the goods and services those dollars subsidized. The Act's prohibition of discrimination on the basis of national origin was explicitly extended to language access in the Supreme Court's 1974 Lobby Nichols decision. SB 318 attempts to actualize those protections and that promise that all Nevadans, regardless of language, can access governmental services. Every bill, program, or FTE currently under consideration by this committee, um, each of those are only a just use of taxpayer dollars if all Nevadans, Spanish speaking, Lingala speaking, can your wand and speak in, can understand the related application forms, notices, or systems, and have the needs of their families be understood by staff. I humbly ask the committee members to invest in this two-year civil rights planning exercise, um, and I'm now open to questions. Thank you. Um, Chair Wynn had to step out to do her own presentation, so I will be facilitating questions. Do we have questions from the committee? Well, I had a question related to some of the exhibits that were provided for the for this um, this meeting, this hearing. It looks like most of your fiscal notes have been reviewed or removed. And to be clear, this is a policy committee, not the fiscal committee. But I am curious about um, these removals post the passage from your your house, um, and if any of those are still retained, and if there's an explanation for why the amendment didn't get everybody off, um, uh, if you could um, qualify that, thanks. Thank you so much, Chair Peters. Uh, Fabian Nate for the record. So we, over the last couple of months, um, we have had extensive conversations with each of the uh, departments and agencies as to how this would be implemented once it becomes law. Um, I think it's very clear from our conversations with each of the agencies and departments that this is something that they have wanted for a very long time. But the question is, how do we get to language access? Um, part of the amendment that we submitted on the Senate side was to, again, reiterate that I am not, based on this, Ms. Uh, Ms. Olivia White and I, we are not looking for implementation. We are looking for you to determine what you need to implement language access. And that has been made clear by the fiscal notes that have been removed. Uh, for the most part, there is only one that's outstanding. Um, it's with the Department of Corrections, if you would like to ask them any questions beyond that. But we made clear to them that our bill is only on creating the access plan, and it's simply an exercise, not for implementation. Thank you. I did um, look at some of that um, language and, and, the, and the fiscal note. I, it's my understanding from your language that you're not requiring a, like an additional person, that it's just somebody who may have interest in this, who can champion it through their offices. Okay, that makes sense. Are there any other questions um, from uh, Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson? Please go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you for the spill because um, I think in, in previous conversations, um, the intersection between language access and health equity, right? That's the, the new big policy frontier that we're going to have to battle moving forward. And it'll be, you know, future legislatures, legislatures that will decide whether we do that kind of piecemeal statute by statute here, you know, here and there. Um, but it, it's, it's a question that is, is I think the next, one of the big, next big policy things that we have to tackle in this building. Um, I want to ask on uh, Section 7 specifically, um, so this is dealing with the executive department um, and a language access plan. So I guess, could you tell me a little bit more about what you would hope to see as that work product? Like, I guess when I look at some of these pieces, some of them are, are um, easy, uh, readily some of them have more uh, readily handy data that we don't necessarily have to go 
you know, create a new way to pull out the data, like on the B in Section 7, uh, the 2B, which is the relevant demographics, if we're looking at health and human services or Medicaid or TANF, like lots of lots of data, lots of, lots of data on demographics there. Um, so uh, for, I guess for some of the some of the other departments, I guess, tell me just a little bit more about the type of work product you're hoping to see from them. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman uh, Fabian Nate, for the record. I'm actually going to turn it over to Ms. Olivia Whiteley, who can speak more to that. Thanks, Senator. This is Olivia Whiteley for the record. Um, there are a couple of outcomes that we're hoping to see uh, from the language access plans that are required under Section 7. The first thing I'll say is that the, one of the primary purposes of the, creating the plan required under Section 7 would be to allow agencies to develop a robust, detailed understanding of what costs would be associated with implementing the language access plan and ensuring that all Nevadans can understand and access their services. Uh, the bill does require uh, agencies to submit that fiscal note in the 2023-2025 biennium so that that can be a discussion um, occurring in the legislature during that period. So all of the language access planning components are really purposed towards ensuring that agencies can then take that next step of implementation. In regards to the content of the plan, you're correct in that first, it does require agencies to gather demographic data. Um, and this can be done in a couple of different ways. The second thing it allows or requires agencies to include in their language access plans would be an inventory of existing services. And this inventory was based off of the Department of Justice's language access assessment and planning tool. So it goes through things like training, what training is provided to employees. And it's fairly specific asking them, do you pro provide employees with training on how to talk with a limited English proficient individual over the phone via email? email in person. So it goes through a checklist of those existing services. Um, the language access plan also requires agencies uh, to report on ways where law might need to be modified, as you mentioned, um, to better serve limited English proficient Nevadans. Um, it requires agencies to evaluate where areas uh, that translators and interpreter certifications are not listed for their particular agency activities, um, and perhaps even what conjunction there would be with workforce development opportunities, um, as sometimes for these um, less frequently spoken languages, um, there is even a lack of local interpretation or translation resources available for an agency to use. So it also attempts to fill some of those gaps. I, I appreciate that. And I know it's like, it's a long, hard road. I have already on my calendar for June 10th and interim meeting on the, the ITAB, which is, I think it's the Techno Information Technology Assistance Board, where it's the, um, you know, the committee that looks at the technology of the state. And obviously our meetings were disrupted during the pandemic, but uh, that, you know, when that body or in that committee is where we talk about the work just to become ADA compliant. And I know that even since the ADA has been in place and then we're talking about our technology piece that we're still think I want to say the last, um, the last comment we had on the record about six months ago was so like more than a decade away from being fully ADA compliant, just on our state's websites for that. And so I would say, um, what I've learned is wherever you can fit it into different pieces as they're moving, then then jump on it there, right? As long as we're having the conversation about modernizing some of our systems and we have it, uh, we talk about accessibility of language or accessibility, we ought to just make sure that we're adding language in there as well because for those pieces that we're starting to modernize now, at least we can look at a language component um, and then you play catch up on on everything else. So as much as I as I as as you, is you can make, sh I would say that you would, I would hope you would want this section at least to be, you know, if it isn't already like liberally construed to make sure that the executive branches aren't, uh, that where they see an opportunity to do some of this work that they, that they can, right? Um, and that way you, you know, it might be, it's not like a symmetrical kind of progress. It might be asymmetrical where you see certain departments moving ahead better than, than others. I think some are more organically equipped 
and, and come at this at a different place than others. You can tell by the type of fiscal notes that we get from some departments when we ask for culture change, like kind of systemic culture change, you know, how willing or not they are. It's kind of the first bellwether to whether who's interested in doing this or not or who's going to put up a fight in doing it or not. Um, so uh, I, I think it's headed in the right direction. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll be work that we see them engage in in a meaningful way. I get that they're busy, um, but it, I, it'll, it'll lead us to a better place. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Our, um, I have Assemblywoman Titus next. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. Senator, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, this problem is real. Uh, I just uh, just a comment during this COVID epidemic, we had significant issues reaching out to our guest worker programs in my community where we bring in a huge number of guest workers and making sure that the information uh, regarding COVID and the need for certain um, whether it's washing your hands, whether it's social distancing, whether it was mask, whatever the comments were, they initially were not in um, in Spanish or which was what the language was mostly in, in, in our area that needed to be. And I just wanted to take on the record right now that few may know that uh, I reached out to Assemblyman Flores and Assemblywoman Torres to help me try to put together some information because they were already doing that on their own. Even though the state had stuff that was out there, it wasn't really... I asked them, well, interpret this. Well, how would you see this and, and recommendation? So having a, a process where not only is it in, in Spanish per se, it's actually in a format that somebody reading it would understand it and not be threatened by it. So um, it's not really a question. I just want to thank you for bringing it forward. I, I think this is important. And, and uh, for those doubters out there, I, I, it was a significant aha moment for me this last summer when we couldn't get the information out and we needed to get it out in not only their language but in whatever the translation was that they would accept and trust and it's all about building trust in the healthcare system not just having some bureaucrat write it in Spanish that it wasn't really their language anyway it was a you know textbook kind of interpretation so I think there's a there's a, a huge need here uh, and so thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you for the comment. Are there any other questions from the committee before we move on to testimony? Seeing none, thank you so much. We will go ahead and move on to support testimony. Is there anybody in the committee room who is here to testify in support of SB 318? Seeing none, I'd ask broadcast. Could you please open the lines um, for anyone in support of three? Uh, sorry, SB 318? To testify in support of Senate Bill 318, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 565, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 565, please press star 6 to unmute. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Manuel Mederos for the record. I'm the language access specialist for the Northern Nevada International Center in Reno, Nevada. I run a program called the Language Bank. I'm giving testimony in full support of SB 318 because it is a critical that each Nevada state agency is really able to create their own language access plan. This plan would help state agencies meet the language needs of Nevada's experiencing significant barriers to accessing state services related to COVID-19 due to the lack of materials and information translated. I cannot say enough and emphasize enough about the importance of providing appropriate access to language services, which would provide much needed culturally and linguistically appropriate language services to our growing diverse communities. As many of you have recognized today, Nevada is an extremely diverse state. It is beyond Spanish, it is beyond English. There's a multitude of languages in our state. So 
providing equal services to clients regardless of their spoken language is a crucial component in the provision of trauma-informed, non-discriminatory, safe, and effective assistance to all members of our communities throughout our wonderful state of Nevada. Today, the focus is COVID-19. However, in the future, it could be something else, a disaster of some sort, another pandemic, or a statewide emergency. This bill would allow each state agency and personnel to make language access plans appropriately. Furthermore, this bill would allow and help state agencies to train their personnel so that they can effectively communicate with limited English individuals and can effectively work with language interpreters. Lastly, the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted nearly every aspect of our lives and has reached into nearly every community in our state. Our ability to keep one another safe and healthy depends on every Nevada having access to credible, trusted information about how to prevent the spread of COVID-19, the types of supports and services available, and how to comply with federal and state and local orders. We know certain communities are disappropriately impacted by this pandemic, and one way we can shift that injustice is to is by meeting our obligation to communicate in ways that are accessible and culturally and linguistically relevant. We need SB 318. We need it so bad to ensure that our underserved communities can access life-saving information and care. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your time for hearing me today, and please support SB 318. Thank you so much for your impassioned testimony. Um, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits, 656. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, my name's Will Pregman, representing Battleborn Progress, W-I-L-L-P, as in Peter, R-E-G-M-A-N. We rise in support of SB 318. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Nevada families who either aren't affluent in English or don't speak uh, English as their primary language are often alienated from COVID-19 public resources. Luckily, there was a network of community support to ensure these materials were translated and help folks connect with housing, health care, food, or other resource assistance that they needed. We thank Senator Dunyate for bringing forward this bill to provide information on state resources in multiple languages. We support this effort to make a social, our social safety net accessible to all communities, regardless of which language they speak, so they have accurate information on how, they, how to find what they need. We urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next caller, please. Vice Chair, there are no more callers on the line in support. Thank you so much. Are there any, uh, anybody in the room who would like to testify in opposition to SB 318? Seeing none, I would ask that broadcast please check the lines for any opposition callers for SB 318. To testify in opposition to Senate Bill 318, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, there are no callers in opposition. Thank you. I would now ask for neutral testimony on SB 318. We have one in the room. We will go ahead and start here. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Bradley Mayer, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-M-A-Y-E-R, partner with Argentum Partners, representing the Southern Nevada and Washoe County Health Districts today. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the sections of the bill that apply to us uh, we really appreciate senator donate and miss whitley for uh, working with us early he engaged us right away um, when this idea emerged and worked with us uh, on the bill uh, throughout the the course of the hearings in the other house um, to get it to a place where uh, we can ensure kind of maximum effectiveness from the health district's perspective on the execution of this especially as it relates to money being available for these services so we thank him and just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Seeing no one else in the room to testify in neutral, I would ask the that broadcast open the lines for neutral testimony on Senate Bill 318. To testify in neutral, Senate Bill 318, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, zero, zero, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with 
Caller, you appear to be unmuted on our end, but we can't hear you. Is your phone muted? Sorry, I didn't hear the last digits. This is for 891. Uh, this is for Senate Bill 318. Correct. I was just checking in to make sure that it was me. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Peters and members of the committee. For the record, Margarita Salas Crespo, Senior Advisor to the Governor's Office for New Americans, testifying in neutral for SB 318. The Governor's Office for New Americans was created to ensure the civic and economic integration and inclusion of immigrant and refugees in the state of Nevada, which account for 20% of the population in our state. Providing language access services helps bridge the communication barrier with individuals who cannot speak, understand, read, or write fluently in the host country language. A Nevada language and demographic data report provided to our office by the New American Economy indicates that 152, 391, or 52 percent of the share of Nevada immigrant and refugees um, have a limited English proficiency. SB 318 seeks to bridge the gap of communication by proactively ensuring that the Division of Public and Behavioral Health and the Department of Health and Human Services and each district health department uh, take reasonable measures to ensure that persons with limited English proficiency or LEPs have meaningful and timely access to services to restrain the spread of COVID-19. As we all know, immigrant and refugees and people of color have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in trying to ensure the access to benefits and resources in a language they understand and in a culturally competent manner is one way to ensure an equitable COVID-19 response. In addition to addressing language access for the COVID-19 response, Section 7 of this bill requires each executive department of the state government to develop and biannually revise a language access plan, or LAP. As an initial step towards ensuring that each state agency provides high quality and appropriate language services, to the constituency they serve. A language access plan will help in the success of the state's efforts to ensure that all Nevadans have access to accurate, timely, and vital information in the language they understand and in a culturally competent manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcast, is there anyone else on the line for neutral testimony? Yes, Vice Chair, with the caller with the last three digits, 109. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, Vice Chair. Sean Sever from the DMV, S-E-A-N-S-E-V-E-R. Um, I just wanted to comment on our uh, fiscal note. We are neutral on the bill, of course, uh, but after receiving clarification that the bill calls only for the formation of a language access plan and not the actual implementation of the plan, we have determined that DMV's fiscal note can be revised to indicate a no fiscal impact. Thank you. Thank you for putting that on the record as this is not the fiscal committee. We will ensure that that's on the record for the bill, but pass that information on to our fiscal committees. Is there anyone else on the line for um, neutral testimony? Vice Chair, there are no more callers for neutral testimony. Thank you so much. Um, I would go ahead and ask if the bill sponsor has any closing remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Peters, um, for the opportunity to speak with you all today and, of course, to the committee members. Um, the one thing that I would just want to share is that when I first started off in this journey um, in the Senate trying to figure out what bills I wanted to push forward, I knew that language access and public health had to be one of those priorities um, for the sake of my family um, and the greater immigrant community as a whole. So SB 318 is an effort that can address many of the observed gaps that we see in translational services. and most importantly, it reframes the conversation of increasing access for the COVID-19 vaccine, for public health, um, but in reality, it provides leverage to Nevada families that have been ignored or forgotten for far too long. So thank you all for your consideration today. Thank you so much, Senator. With that, I will close a hearing on SB 318. That concludes... I believe the bills we had on the agenda for today um, and our last piece um, of, um, of agenda item was public comment. We can go ahead and be uh, begin public comment as a reminder to provide public comment by phone you must register online via the legislative website information is also available on our agenda please remember to clearly state and spell your name and limit your comments to two minutes is there anyone in the room who wants to testify under public comment Seeing none, um, I would ask that broadcast, please check the line, see if there's anybody on the phone who would like to testify in public comment. To participate in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Vice Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers wishing to participate at this time. Thank you so much. Um, looking at the committee, is there are there any uh, remaining comments from the committee? Seeing none, that concludes our meeting for today. Um, I believe we have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday, but I would unclear if that is at a time we're at call of the chair. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're this week we're pl we're playing it by call of the chair. Um, so so uh, you know, pay attention to to our um, our chat boxes, and we'll let you know when to expect that on Wednesday. And with that, thank you so much, committee. Have a nice rest of your afternoon, um, and I think I'll see you down on floor.